Hey everyone, welcome back. Today, let's go through a cardiovascular review for step two. So this will probably be split into multiple parts and we'll probably do a separate part for step one, more basic science focused. But let's go through some high yield step two concepts and then let's talk about how to approach these questions. So this will all be practice question based, um, but the first slide in each category will sort of go through the basics and then we'll go through practice questions one by one. So here's the first slide here. So let's start with heart anatomy. So the way that you should approach cardiac questions is, especially when it comes to flow problems, is visualize the normal flow and what it should be. So I have a, a little depiction here. So SVC, so superior vena cava, so let's just draw through the blood. So superior vena cava, right atrium, passes through the tricuspid into the right ventricle, through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery, continuing here into the lungs. Then we come back through the pulmonary veins, left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, left aortic valve into the aortic arch, and then out into systemic circulation. So when you're picturing valve problems, murmurs, heart pathology, if you picture normal flow and then think of how it's disrupted and what you're hearing or what they're giving you on physical exam, you can oftentimes figure it out just, just by doing that. And so we'll go through some examples, but we'll, we'll reference this multiple times throughout this video because we're going to think about what normal is and how the question is telling us what's abnormal. So let's do a question and go through this. 34-year-old patient presents to the ED with fevers, chills, and malaise for three days. He states he has no medical conditions other than a heart condition that he can't remember the name of. And on physical exam, he has a two out of six holosystolic murmur at the apex and various superficial hemorrhages visible in the fingernails. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And let's see what choices we have. We have mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, mitral valve prolapse, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or hokum, mitral stenosis, and aortic regurgitation. Give you a couple seconds to figure this one out. You can pause the video if you need to. And so we'll go, we'll just jump straight to the answer here. So the one answer for this one is mitral regurgitation. So there are a few ways you can figure this out. The murmur findings, which tell you if you're familiar with the murmur terminology, so the holosystolic murmur at the apex was supposed to give this one away. Um, but oftentimes in these questions, even if you don't know what the murmur sounds like, they'll give you enough history that you can have an idea of what this question is telling you. So fever, chills, malaise for a few days, previously known heart condition, and superficial hemorrhages in his fingernails. So that sh the superficial hemorrhages is is very, very indicative of infective endocarditis. And we know that the most common in the developed world, the most common cause of endocarditis in a previously affected valve um, affects the mitral valve, secondary to mitral valve prolapse. So mitral valve prolapse was probably his underlying condition, but it's not the diagnosis at this time because it's not what, the car, what that murmur sounds like. That would be a mid-systolic click would be the typical sound you hear with the mitral valve prolapse. So this is probably infective endocarditis, and so then you could probably narrow it down just based off of that. We know that the tricuspid valve is infected, typically in IV drug users. The mitral valve is also typically affected in rheumatic heart disease, and the mitral valve, if previously affected, can be affected first in infective endocarditis. So now let's talk about murmurs themselves. Let's go through and split these up. So systolic, diastolic, and we'll focus on four here, but this can be applied to other murmurs as well. So let's go through the answer choice first is mitral regurgitation. So it's holosystolic and it's at the mitral area. So the first step you want to start with is where is the murmur located? So you want to start with the auscultation locations here. So the mitral valve location typically occurs here. And if you if you look at the actual positioning of the mitral valve, it's, it's directly here. So normally the mitral valve sends blood through the mitral this way into the left, eight, into the left ventricle. So when blood backflows from the mitral valve, you hear it going backwards this way towards the mitral area. So you can always think of when the blood is flowing normally, if you picture the blood going in the exact opposite direction, that's where you would hear it when you auscultate. So it's a little confusing because if you think about the aortic and the mitral area, it's a little bit away from where the valve is because that's where the blood is flowing towards in, in a, the setting of a murmur. So it's the opposite of the way it normally flows. And why is it holosystolic? So let's look down here at this 
this picture. So this is what the mitral valve normally looks like. So during systole, the mitral valve closes to allow the left ventricle to build up, build up pressure. So picture this building up pressure, and then eventually this pressure outdoes the pressure held by this aortic valve. Blood shoots this way like it normally should, sends it to systemic circulation. So that's systole. The first half, all the valves are closed. You're building up pressure. The second half, this valve opens, the aortic valve sends blood through the systemic circulation. So in mitral regurgitation, this valve isn't strong enough to hold up to the pressure that the left ventricle is generating. So blood backflows this way. So when it backflows, you hear the sound in the mitral area, but on top of that, you also hear a holosystolic murmur. So throughout systole, the mitral valve should be closed because you're building up pressure and then you're ejecting. So holosystolic means throughout systole. So the reason it's holosystolic is because this valve is normally closed the entire time of systole, but in mitral regurgitation, it's weak enough that the blood regurgitates through in a holosystolic manner throughout systole. And that's how you can tell that it's mitral regurgitation and not some of the other murmurs that we're talking about. So let's move on. Aortic stenosis. It's typically a crescendo, decrescendo murmur at the aortic area. So aortic area is typically right about here. And if you think about the purple valve here is the aortic valve. So blood comes through the aorta to the systemic circulation. But again, instead of it being regurgitating backwards this time, instead picture stenosis as the sound that's occurring when the blood crosses the stenotic valve, but is going in its normal direction. So if you picture the blood flowing this direction and you hear it, but it's stenotic, you hear it forward instead of backwards. So the aortic valve stenosis sound you would hear here at the upper right sternal border typically. It's crescendo decrescendo because as systole is happening, as we just talked about, the blood crosses the aortic valve and it picks up in, in sound as the blood is crossing the valve. It's peaking, it's peaking, it goes higher and higher, crescendo, and then as less blood is crossing it at the end of systole, it's a decrescendo. So it's this up and then down, a crescendo decrescendo is why it looks like that. It's not holosystolic, like mitral regurgitation. So we know both of these are systolic, so we know that it's systolic, we can narrow it down to these two and a handful of other murmurs if we're given those. We can then choose based on area. It's not the aortic. It's not the mitral. We can pick based on those two. And then we can also pick based on the features of the murmur itself. So here's some other hints with aortic stenosis. Diminished S2 sound. As this valve becomes more and more stenotic, over time, it the sound that it makes when it closes, which is the S2 sound, goes away. If this valve gets thick enough where you can't hear it close, you know it's worsening. You also know that that's indicative of aortic stenosis. Pulses parvus et tardis is the delayed and diminished rising of the pulses. So if this valve becomes stenotic enough, you're not getting the pressure that you normally develop in the aorta, which causes weakened pressures in all the distal extremities as well as the carotids. Also, the sound can radiate to the carotids. If the sound occurs through this single passageway, you can hear the murmur kind of radiate straight. These, are, these would be the pathway to your carotids. And so you can hear it radiate straight towards the carotids. So let's move on to diastolic murmurs. So aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis now. So aortic regurgitation is an early decrescendo at the left sternal border. So this is the flipped version of aortic stenosis. So instead of in systole, when the blood crosses through the aortic valve, and it flows this way in a stenotic valve. Instead, picture diastole. When this valve is supposed to be closed, the left ventricle is relaxing, pressure is higher in the aorta, this should be closed, so high pressure, low pressure shuts this valve. But in aortic regurgitation, this valve leaks, so early in diastole, instead of the blood filling and flowing through your aorta and your systemic circulation, it regurgitates back into the left ventricle. So it's an early decrescendo because it starts at its peak, it regurgitates, and then the valve recaptures the blood and it stops. And so it's an early decrescendo as opposed to a crescendo decrescendo. But the left sternal border is the location instead of the right sternal border because the blood is regurgitating back a little bit. So it is this same aortic area in the sense that it's 
because of the aortic valve, but the location may be a little different. It may be like this area in the left sternal border, if you picture the sternum directly over the heart here. So don't be confused if the aortic regurgitation is a slightly different area and you're like, wait, I thought the aortic area was closer to the right side. It depends on the way the murmur is flowing. So regurgitation, the murmur is heard because the blood is flowing backwards, hence why the regurgitation murmur is heard on this side. And we get hyperdynamic circulation, such as water hammer pulses, head bobbing. And so the way that happens, so normally in diastole, systole is ejecting the blood into the aorta. Diastole is normally relaxing the blood back into the, or into the systemic circulation, and then the valves are closing to let the blood flow back into the heart. So the reason you have a hyperdynamic circulation is if you have this blood that regurgitates back into the left ventricle, that's more blood pooling in the left ventricle in diastole. So I want you to think of this blood that's supposed to be here ends up in the left ventricle, which expands the left ventricle. So now the second time, so contraction one, we have a normal systole, blood regurgitates back. Now in the second systole, we have blood from the left atrium, which is normal coming into the left ventricle, but we also have blood from the regurgitation. So now we have, if you think about double the blood here in the left ventricle, now we have another contraction, which remember, the valve is not stenotic. So in systole, the same, the same force is generated. Now you have double the blood going into systemic circulation, but then again, in diastole, it regurgitates. So you have a larger contraction of more blood, which causes this hyperdynamic circulation. So you'll feel their pulses, their head will be bobbing, their nails will be throbbing. And then diastole, more blood rips back out of the cardiac or out of the aorta back into the cardiac circulation, which causes this huge drop in the pulse, which is the widened pulse pressure you can see. There's a huge difference between the aortic or the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure in aortic regurgitation. And that's why blood is ejecting in double the quantity into the aorta and systole, and it's pulling back in diastole, causing a diminished diastolic pressure. So mitral stenosis is the other diastolic murmur. So in diastole, left atrium typically is letting blood flow into the left ventricle and filling, filling, filling while this valve is closed. So the opening snap you can hear is the stenotic valve snapping open after the pressure of the left atrium is able to overcome the stenosis. And the diastolic rumble is the blood actually flowing across the valve. So the opening snap is the, is the valve itself opening. Diastolic rumble is the murmur of the flow as the blood comes into the left ventricle. And again, this will be at the mitral area because this valve, if you see here, this valve is pointed down in this direction. So you'll then generally hear it here at the apex. And chronic rheumatic heart disease is the most common way you'll hear this. Um, over time, when a valve is destroyed by rheumatic fever, the valve becomes stenotic, even though initially, acutely, you might see a regurgitation. It can also lead to atrial fibrillation. So if you think of a stenotic valve, the left atrium is typically a, a weaker heart chamber pushing against the stenotic valve. Over time, you'll dilate this left atria. And once an atria becomes dilated and floppy, you can eventually have ectopic foci that can develop, foci develop, and you can lead to atrial fibrillation. So go through these systolic versus diastolic, then specify the area and then think about what's happening in the flow of the cardiac cycle to figure out each murmur. Let's move on. Next question here, a 62-year-old patient presents to the ED with chest pain, shortness of breath, and diaphoresis, currently unconscious. The heart rate is 110, blood pressure is 105 over 62, and hemodynamic markers include increased right atrial pressure, increased pulmonary artery pressure, and decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? We have pulmonary embolism, MI, systemic vasodilation, neurogenic shock, and hypovolemia as our choices. Pause for one second. And here is the bold, and here's the answer, pulmonary embolism. So this was largely supposed to be a shock question. You see the shock-like symptoms, the shock vital signs, and then you, you're given hemodynamic markers. So we're gonna go through these, but increased pulmonary artery pressure and decreased PCWP is typical of pulmonary embolism. It's an obstructive form of shock. And so let's go through how these features happen on the next slide. 
So we have hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive shocks, if you split it into four categories. So in each category has a primary feature that's happening. Obstructive shock, there's some sort of obstruction in the lung vasculature that's causing the blood to back up from the lungs to the right side of the heart. So that's what we saw in this question. So PCWP, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, is basically a measure of the left atrial pressure. So if PCWP is low, we know that blood is missing from the left atrium. So we know, okay, if there's an obstruction, it's proximal to this. And then they gave us that the right atrial and right ventricle pressure were elevated. So we know that, okay, it's, it's less here. That means we know the obstruction is proximal in the lungs. And then now they've given us proof that that blood is backing up into the right ventricle and right atria. So we're given the exact parameters we need to figure out that that was an obstructive shock. In that case, PE was the choice. So let's say um, in, in cardiogenic, what would that look like? So in cardiogenic, typically you have an MI or some other insult to the left ventricle, which causes the left ventricle to not generate its pressure to shoot the blood to the systemic circulation. So in that setting, you would have the, the source of backup would start in the left ventricle and you would have increased PCWP, the left atrial pressure, because the blood is backing up from the left ventricle into the left atria. So we know that wasn't right in that question, but we can see when it would be right. In distributive shock, like sepsis, for example, the primary problem is a vascular insult. So endotoxin, like lipopolysaccharide from bacteria, causes damage directly to your, your arteries and, and systemic vessels typically have pressure that they generate to send blood further and further into your capillary beds. So if you have a direct insult to the vessels, you have vasodilation and pooling in your systemic arterial circulation, which is the primary problem. So you would have a decreased SVR would be the number one thing you would find. And then you can distinguish sepsis as well because you would have an increased um, venous oxygen saturation, as your tissues are dying, they're not able to pull the oxygen from the tissues like you normally would. And then hypovolemic over here, the primary insult is decreased circulation of blood because you're either dehydrated, you've been hemorrhaging something or the other. So you have decreased venous return to the heart, which causes you to have decreased left atrial or right atrial, right ventricular, and left atrial, left ventricular. So all of the pressures in the heart will be decreased, but you'll have increased systemic vascular resistance as you, your body basically contracts all of these in the response to hypovolemia. And then you have decreased venous return as the deep, if you picture this as a giant tube full of fluid, this, the amount of fluid in here is decreased as opposed to sepsis or distributive shock where it's not the amount, it's the damage to the vessels that's letting the blood leak out into the tissues out of the circulation. So hypovolemic shock, the primary feature you'll find is hypovolemia and you'll secondarily get an increase in SVR. So it's flipped from a septic picture. So don't get these two confused. They can be easy to confuse. And then cardiogenic and obstructive, we can separate based on what is happening with the left side of the heart. Cardiogenic, the obstruction is in the left heart, pressures increase in the left atria, versus obstructive, the pressures are occluded in the middle, in the lungs. So the right heart pressures are increased, but the left heart pressures are decreased because the blood can't get over to the, to the left heart. So next question. A five-year-old female presents to the clinic for a well-child check. She has a history of a prolonged stay in the NICU, met all developmental milestones. Cardiac oscillation is notable for a grade two mid-systolic murmur best heard at the left sternal border. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So we have atrial septal defect, PDA, still murmur, VSD, and coarctation of the aorta. So give you one second. So the answer here is still murmur, and a grade two mid systolic murmur at the left sternal border is typical. And so the main thing I wanted you to understand here is that these other murmurs, A, B, D, and E, will all have some sort of pathologic finding that helps you tell that it's not a normal murmur and that you should do something about it and that also that it is indicative of these other choices. So still murmur, you can move on here, 
is the most common innocent murmur in children. So the etiology isn't quite determined to my knowledge, but it can be louder when supine. So if you hear a benign systolic murmur in a child and can't figure it out, and they're trying to give you every indication that it seems normal, then still murmur could be a choice. So an atrial septal defect, the atria are directly in this picture would be directly here. The atria are obviously here and here, but you can't, you can't see where a septal defect would be. So wide fixed splitting of the S2 is what you get. So basically, every time the blood comes from the SVC into the right atria, it passes like it normally would, and then it flows back across from the left atria because the left side typically has higher pressures. It flows across to the right atria, and then it just continues back to how it normally would. So the fixed split, so you remember that S2 sound of the aortic and the pulmonic valve can sometimes be split when you inspire because you decrease the pressures and you cause the aortic valve to be heard, then the pulmonic, pulmonic to be heard. So in a wide fixed split, it's because you're sending blood from the left atrium to the right atria, and that increased pressure means that this will always be split no matter when you're inspiring or not. So splitting is normal in a normal person when you're inspiring, but when you're not inspiring, there shouldn't be a split. These valves should be heard at the exact same time. But when you shunt blood across to the right side, you will always hear a split regardless of whether or not you're inspiring. And that's the problem is this wide fixed split. And you may have a distractor murmur, but it's usually exactly that, a distractor murmur. That The murmur itself with ASD is, is not typically heard. It's usually a secondary murmur. VSD, um, it's the most common congenital heart defect. It's a holosystolic murmur at the left sternal border. So if you picture the sternum here, the VSD would be right here. The blood would flow across holosystolic because throughout systole, this is open. It's not a valve. It doesn't close. So this is open the entire time. You can track, send blood across. So you know it's holosystolic at the lower left sternal border because you know this is the sternum. And so that would be the exact location. So you can figure that one out pretty easily. Always get an echo on an NBME if you hear a VSD. And for these two, management for ASD, you may not have to do anything. For a VSD, you would at least you would at least get an echo. You'd probably get an echo for both of them. And then you can manage a VSD based on the findings. So if the infant is becoming volume overloaded because of a VSD, you know that you would need to do management, surgical potential management to close that. We already talked about still murmur. And let's talk about these last two, the continuous murmurs. So a PDA and a coarctation. So coarctation is depicted here. Blood flows through the aorta. It's coming down to the descending aorta. And a coarctation is a narrowing of the distal aorta here. So you would have differential pressures in the upper and lower extremities. The upper extremities would be getting circulation here perfectly fine. And, you're, and it, would, it would probably be increased because of the pressure blockage here. And as blood flows through and down through the coarctation, there's less blood flowing through. And so you have decreased pressures in your lower extremities. So you can have claudication or pain in your lower extremities. You can also have rib notching because as the aorta is blocked here, your body tries to compensate. The intercostal arteries, which aren't depicted here, can basically fill with blood to try and overcome and go around this blockage. And over time, that can decay and erode the ribs basically from pressure necrosis of the ribs from pressing against the um, intercostal arteries versus a PDA is a connection. It would be right here between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So as the high pressure blood flows through here, it would drop down into the low pressure pulmonary circulation and you would basically have it recycled back into the circulation. So both of these would be continuous murmurs Obviously, the hint in PDA is the machine-like sound, the infraclavicular reason. So if we have the sternum here, the aorta is all the way here. Just your clavicle would be right about here. So the infraclavicular region is just where the sound is occurring. So this is completely outside of the heart. So it would be continuous because there's no valve. Again, it's always happening. It's not systolic or diastolic. Regardless, this opening would be present. And so you would have a continuous murmur. Coarctation is true for the same reason. This is this narrowing is always present, so it's continuous. It's never changing in size, so it's not going to be a holosystolic or diastolic murmur. And PDA, just remember that in cyanotic heart conditions, you often need a different shunt to help that cyanotic blood get back to the left side 
and back across to the right side so that you can mix circulation and continue um, with the viable heart. So a PDA can be present by itself, but if it's present in a cyanotic baby, you know that it's there as a secondary murmur, not as the primary murmur. So PDA and coarctation are the only continuous ones in this situation. ASD is its own separate thing. VSD is pretty easy to tell. And still murmur is kind of a rule out murmur that you can figure out. Let's do the next one. This five day old presents with hypotension and cyanosis. No, minimal prenatal follow-up. Physical exam is notable for diminished peripheral pulses. Echo reveals abnormal aortic and mitral valves and a PDA. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Truncus arteriosus, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, tetralogy of Fallot, Epstein anomaly, and TAP VR. Give you a second, and then we'll go ahead and click to the answer. So this is indicative of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So there wasn't much to go off of here, but like we just talked about, a PDA in the setting of cyanosis, you know that there is a, the PDA is secondary to a cyanotic murmur, and it's helping that murmur. Um, otherwise, the baby would be unable to get oxygenated blood to the circulation. So the abnormal aortic and mitral valves we'll talk about here now. So HLHS is depicted here, and so you have a hypoplastic, the entire left side of the heart is hypoplastic. So yeah, they can tell you that the left heart would be underdeveloped on an echo, but that would obviously be easy in a question, so they may not do that. But both the left-sided valves are abnormal typically as well, so the aortic and mitral valves. Aortic valve is supposed to be here, or mitral valve is supposed to be here, aortic is supposed to be here, and you have diminished valves because the whole left side, left side of the heart is atrophic. So that's the hint, and you require in this case, an ASD, and then as the blood comes through here, a PDA to get into systemic circulation. So you need two shunts, one to get it to the right side and go to the lungs, and one to get it back across and go back to systemic circulation. So you would typically, there's a series of surgeries you would need to have happen, but that's probably not going to come across in your questions. Tetralogy of Fallot. So the primary feature is displacement of the infundibular septum, and we'll, we'll contrast that with transposition. The primary problem is failure of the aorticopulmonary septum to spiral. So this area typically spirals to form, and you can imagine how this looks like it's spiraled. The aortic goes like this, and the pulmonary artery comes over top and then snakes underneath it. So failure of spiraling would be a um, transposition versus displacement would be pulmonary or a tetralogy of Fallot leads to the PROV abnormalities, but remember the outflow is limited by pulmon pulmonic stenosis, that's high yield, so right ventricular outflow. As the valve, stenotic valve, the blood flows through it, it backs up, and then it shunts across. So the, the amount that the pulmonic valve is stenotic, that determines how the blood shunts across the right side of the heart and how much cyanosis is present. And we know that both tetralogy and transposition are associated with DeGeorge syndrome. So that's a hint there. Tricuspid atresia, you can think of it as a right-sided atresia instead of a left-sided problem like hypoplastic left heart. So it would be a complete absence of this connection here between the right atria and the right ventricle. So you'd probably have an um, abnormal looking right ventricle. You'd have right atrial dilation. And we know that the backup occurs here. And so the only way that this would be functional is if the blood could shunt here across an ASD and then shunt back through either a VSD or through a PDA, one or the other. Um, so you need both shunts, again, to be able to make this viable circulation. Transposition of the great vessels. So these two vessels don't spiral. So instead, they're flipped. The <clears throat> pulmonary artery is attached to the left ventricle. The aorta is attached to the right ventricle. So again, you need shunts to make that make that happen as well. And then total and almost pulmonary venous return. Basically, instead of the pulmonary venous return coming to the left atrium, like normal, it comes to the right side. And so you also need shunts to be able to make this, make this happen as well. So just keep in mind that you need what are normally acyanotic shunts to keep these a lot of these cyanotic heart conditions viable. And if you don't, you'll have a earlier and a more severe presentation. So let's move on from 
structural problems. Let's move on to cardiac conduction. So we'll talk a little bit about normal conduction. So the sinoatrial node is just about here at the junction of the SVC and the right atrium. Normally it sends signals throughout the left atria in this sort of pattern, as well as to the left atria at the same time, which causes conduction to the AV node. Then once it hits the AV node, the signal continues through the bundle of Hiss to the right and left bundle branches, Purkinje fibers, and then into the left ventricle. And so that's how you have your passage of normal electrical conduction to let the contractions occur, atria, then ventricles, and the, con the conduction switches directions because you want the blood to come through this way, through the, the big arteries in the heart. So remember, that's normal, so let's talk about abnormal. A 65-year-old female presents to the ED because of dizziness and syncopal episodes witnessed by a family member. The pulse is noted to be 38, and the EKG is depicted below. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So spend a minute and go through what you see in this EKG. So I'll show you the answer and then we'll talk about the EKG here. So this is third degree AV block. And so this is one of the mo more confusing AV blocks that a lot of people have trouble with. So if you, if you look at what this strip looks like down here, you can start by looking at two. You see, okay, there's a QRS complex, looks like a T wave, and then there's a P wave way out here. And there's another one and there's another one, there's another one there probably. So they, they seem kind of, they seem random, first of all, they're just kind of spaced out. They don't seem to be in relation to these QRSs. So I'm looking here. I don't see one right next to this QRS. Same here and same here. Actually, I think I do see a little bit of an inverted P wave there. The point is, is that if you actually step back, zoom out, and you look, and you're saying, let's look at the P waves and measure the distance. So this is one P wave, distance, distance. We're basically coming up with the same width every time. And the same thing with the QRS. We have same width here, same width here, but they don't seem to be related. That is what you see when you see third, AV, third degree AV block. And so the reason I think it's confusing is because a lot of times if it happens to set up where it looks like it's here and then it's a little bit further and then a little bit further. So now you're, you're thinking, well, is this the progressive elongation before it's dropping? And that's the question that I think often confuses people. And the thing I would say to do is to step back. And yes, it does look like it's separating and it's become widening. widening. But if you separ separate the P waves from the QRS complex, you realize <clears throat> these P waves are regular. They're not elongating. It just looks like that because of the way it's related to the QRS complex. Whereas in a progressive PR increase, you would see you would see no drops and you would see a P wave here, increase, increase, and then you'd see a drop, not a closer, and you could say this is the drop here, but it's not this, this regular, it would be a progressive elongation and you wouldn't see this perfectly symmetric pattern in the P waves, how they're conducting and the QRS complex is how they're conducting because the atrium ventricles are basically contracting completely separately from each other. So now we can go through how you can split these up. So first degree block, it's predominantly asymptomatic and it's just a prolonged PR interval. So if it's bigger than one box, it's a first degree AV block. That can happen in athletes and it can be typically a non-pathologic uh, syndrome usually. It can be pathologic. The reason I paired this with third degree AV block here is because these are both what are considered regular. So if you look at that last EKG, you can see that it follows the exact same pattern throughout. It's not changing. The only way it's changing is if you get confused and think that the PR interval is increasing. But in reality, the P waves and the QRS complexes are conducting completely separately. Um, and so that's regular. They're both regular. They're just not coordinated. And so no conduction between the atria and the ventricles. They're beating completely separately, but they're regular, the atria and ventricles, versus the two types of second degree block are irregular. So we talked about the progressive PR increasing. 
that's second degree Mobitz type one or, or Wenke Bach. The QRS complex is dropped after you, you increase, you increase, you increase the length, and then it's dropped. Versus the type two block, the PR wave is in, it, PR interval is constant, 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 then you have a drop. So both of these, instead of, so we saw the EKG for a third degree. For a second degree, it would look a little bit different. Let's go through, I think there's a picture on the next slide. So second degree, you have a short PR, it increases a little bit, it increases even more, and then there's a drop. So there's a P wave here and then a drop. So if you look at these QRS complexes, you have narrow, a little bit wider, really wide, because these are all still in sync. There's just a huge gap between them to tell you that now it's irregular. Versus first degree, same distance, same distance, same distance, because you have this same elongation, but it's not changing. Third degree, again, if you look at the previous EKG, it would see, you would show QRS, 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 QRS. There wouldn't be a, a narrow and then a widening there. It would be always the same distance. And then if you look to the P waves, it would be P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, as opposed to this widening over here. So that's the difference what, I'm, what I was trying to say earlier. So management for first and second degree type one are typically observation. You basically choose whether or not you intervene based on if it's likely to progress to a third degree block. These two are the least likely to progress. So you typically observe. The way you differentiate is obviously if a QRS complex is dropped versus first degree, there's no drop. Now the two ones that typically are more pathologic are second degree type two and third degree. These typically are managed with a pacemaker. Second degree, P wave is the PR, QRS complex happens in the same PR interval, drop, no widening, no widening, and then there's a drop here. So this one is usually pretty easy to tell because it'll be the same exact, it'll look perfect, the QRS complex will look perfect, and then there'll be random P waves. You manage this typically with a pl pacemaker placement. We already talked about third degree, so there's a lack of conduction. So again, measure the distance between QRSs, that's the same that's the same, and then the P waves, the same, then the same, and the same, and so on and so forth. This P wave is buried here in this T wave. So that's how you tell the difference again, and management is typically a pacemaker because this can lead to serious lack of perfusion. And then second degree AV type two is very likely to progress. So these two are considered to be below the level of the AV node versus the previous two are typically considered to be above or at the AV level of the AV node. So these two are much more likely to progress. So you typically need a pacemaker as management. So let's go through an acute situation here. A 65-year-old presents to the ED because of palpitations, a racing heartbeat, fainting. She has a history of hypertension and diabetes, but no chronic health conditions. Her pulse is noted to be 110. Her ECG is depicted below. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? AFib, VTAC, atrial flutter, VFib, or SVT? So I'll give you a second. And let's briefly go through the EKG again. We're not trying to be experts. We're just trying to get through to figure out what they're trying to go for here. So we see um, these QRS complexes, and then we see what I'm seeing is a decrease here. So they become narrow then they become wide again. So the QRS complexes aren't regular and I don't see any, really any P waves. There's clear T waves, but there's no P waves here. That is very typical in the setting, especially of tachycardia. And it's one of the more common types of murmurs here. We know this is atrial fibrillation. It's irregularly, irre irregularly irregular. So this is irregular, but it varies all based on what's happening with the P waves. So we know this is the classic AFib EKG. And so we'll go through, so again, VTAC would be the wide complexes. It would be um, regular. So it'd be a wide complex tachycardia. Atrial flutter would look, the, the there'd be a ratio of sawtooth. So it'd be two to one, three to one, four to one, et cetera. VFib just looks like a bunch of irregular impulses because the, um, ventricles basically aren't getting any proper signal. And then SVT would be if these were complete, the QRS complexes are completely condensed together, and then they were really narrow, that would be SVT. 
So we'll continue on here with the same question here. So this is the exact same scenario. And now the question is asking you for the next best step in management. She's soon to be discharged now. So they're asking, okay, what is the management long-term for this patient? No management, aspirin, heparin, abcixumab, or apixaban. So in this situation, you would choose apixaban, which is a factor 10 antagonist. So it's basically oral anticoagulation. The idea of this is that you want to treat based on, you need to calculate a chads vask score. And so she has the H in chads vask is hypertension, the D is diabetes, and then she's got her age is 65. So she's got a score over two. A score over two indicates that you need anticoagulation. So that's what they're going for here. So we'll look at the chads vask scoring. So all of the chads vasks give you a point, except an age over 75 is automatically two points. And then stroke or TIA is also two points. So they typically don't have you split it by gender on a question, but this is generally how you'd work through it because being female gives you an increased score, but the management typically is almost separated based on um, gender. So zero or one observation, you don't need to do anything. So if she had no underlying comorbidities and was under 65, you could observe. If the score is kind of in between, it's not super, it's like medium risk, you can do aspirin or you can anticoagulate. So they probably won't make you pick. So you'll probably get one or two of these. And if you're given these choices, you can pick either. And then two or more is indicative of a high risk of basically sending clots because a static atrial valve or atrial um, chamber left atria that's contracting an irregular pattern causes stasis, which can cause clots. So this is when you would need long-term anticoagulation. So typically the factor 10 inhibitors, which are all indicated by the XA ban. So it's banning the X, the factor 10 is what the preferred choice is for anticoagulation in this situation. So always calculate the chads vask score in these AFib, A-flutter, atrial problems, these tachycardia problems. And then based on the chads vask score, you can determine management. So now you know why and when you calculate chads vask score. So definitely be doing that because they're not going to tell you to calculate the chads vask score. That's something you have to kind of know in the setting of atrial fib. So let's go through the ACS algorithms for the tachycardias while we're here. So this is the algorithm here on the right. And then I have sort of my simple way to go through it on the left. So here's the algorithm. You basically split into V-fib or pulseless VTAC or asystole versus NPA, PEA. So both V-fib and VTAC, pulseless VTAC, the primary problem is an electrical issue. You're not getting a signal to the ventricle and the ventricles are primarily responsible for giving us our circulation. So you need to shock them. So a D-fib is an un unsynchronized, you just, you just light up the um, paddles and you shock. Then you do CPR and then epi, and you basically repeat in cycles. So you need to pick DFib as the first choice because you're trying to shock this abnormal pulse, abnormal electrical signal in the ventricles. Asystole or PEA, asystole means a complete lack of contraction of the heart. And PEA, it can almost look exactly like a normal QRS complex. You're like, wow, that EKG looks normal. Except the difference is they don't have a pulse and they're unconscious. So with these two, the primary issue is a lack of contraction. So the, the electrical activity can almost look completely normal. So you're trying to stimulate the contraction function of the heart instead of the electrical function. So you do epi first as a beta 2, beta 1, and alpha 1 agonist, and then you do CPR. You don't shock this because the electrical isn't the problem. It's a physical mechanical problem. So that's typically how I approach that. V-fib or pulseless VTAC, D-fib first, then CPR and epi. Asystole or PEA, we know it's a mechanical problem. We do epi, then CPR, and you can kind of repeat those in cycles. Let's do tachycardia now. So again, tachycardia and then instability So is how you figure this out. So you first want to split it up into narrow or wide. So basically, the way you tell that, typically a complex should be less than one small box, maybe almost two. But if it's clearly more than two boxes, that's a wide a wide QRS complex. So with, you split it into narrow or wide, and then you approach unstable or stable. So you can use this if you want. This is more detailed. 
with, with obviously what I'm, everything that I'm talking about, but here's simply, I think, how to understand it. So let's start with narrow. So you see the QRS complex is narrow. narrow. It clearly looks like a tachycardia. The rate is super high, and then they're unstable. So synchronized cardioversion is what you would do. So instead of a defibrillation, you want to sync the paddles to the QRS complex, and you're trying to cardiovert based on this QRS complex. So it's different. This is not a defibrillation. This is a synchronized cardioversion. You're syncing it based on the QRS complexes. Then if they're stable, you know that, okay, they're stable. We don't need to do something right this second. So we can try and work through some things before we try a cardioversion. So you can do vagal maneuvers, dunk their head in water, have them Valsalva, things basically to block this overly, this usually tech narrow complex tachycardias are occurring in the atria and usually you can stop it with vagal maneuvers which will increase the vagal tone and shut down that arrhythmia if that doesn't work you then progress to adenosine which um as you know has a rapid onset set of action and it rapidly distributes and then it's gone so you just shut down the aberrant rhythm and then it's gone basically so again adenosine is the impending doom so you typically if they're not if they're stable and you do this, you want them to be sedated so they don't have to feel this. And then the only exception that you typically see on NBME questions is if it's Wolf Parkinson White. So you see the delta wave and a, it's the complex itself is narrow, but the QRS complex may look wide because of the delta wave. That's when if they're stable, you can do procainamide. You don't want to do adenosine because you can potentially send them into an arrhythmia. They're a completely separate scenario than a normal narrow complex tachycardia. Um, then you have wide. You start with unstable, again, synchronized cardioversion. So that's pretty easy. Unstable, wide, or narrow, you do synchronized cardioversion. But stable, you typically start with IV amiodarone, for example, instead of the vagal maneuvers. So wide complex tachycardias are like ventral tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, but you know VTAC with a pulse is in this category instead of pulseless VTAC. So it's a completely different category. Stable, you typically treat it with IV amiodarone would be your choice. Let's do the bradycardia algorithm. So bradycardia plus symptoms. So again, bradycardia, if a person shows up with a heart rate of 38, like our other question, and doesn't have any symptoms, you don't have to do anything acutely. You need to treat them based on their symptoms. If they're having syncope, if they're feeling like passing out, if they're unconscious, those are symptoms. If they have acute hypotension. So this one's pretty easy. You just do atropine and then say they say, oh, you used atropine and it didn't work. What do you do? Atropine is the next choice too. Then at that, after that point, you can choose between transcutaneous pacing. So you need like an external pacemaker, IV dopamine or IV epi, but usually it doesn't progress like that on a practice question. Usually you can stick with atropine. So that one's pretty simple. Using atropine to block the conduction or to um, basically rapidly increase the heart rate in the setting of symptomatic bradycardia. Let's move on to the last few, a couple of questions here, moving on from arrhythmias back to structural. So a 41-year-old patient, no significant past medical history with fevers, weight loss, syncope. He becomes short of breath on exertion and occasionally loses consciousness. There's an early diastolic sound and a low-pitched mid-diastolic murmur, which of the following is the most likely choice? Myocarditis, cardiac rhabdomyoma, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, atrial myxoma, or acute pericarditis. So we know that with the early diastolic sound, the low-pitched murmur, this is going for atrial myxoma. The other hint here that you need to look out for is fevers and weight loss. So let's talk about that in the next slide. So it's the most common primary cardiac tumor in adults is a myxoma. IL-6 production by the, the tumor itself in the heart causes constitutional symptoms. So if you're confused why they're feverish with just a normal atrial mass, and there's not an infection, it's just production of IL-6 by the myxoma. And then as diastole happens, blood flows from the left atria into the mitral valve. This pressure is decreasing compared to this. So everything is flowing in this direction and this usually pedunculated mass gets stuck, which is the plop sound you hear, completely obstructs this valve and, valve and leads to syncope. So that's that classic picture, what you see in a myxoma. Rhabdomyomas are also benign. So oma, myoma are typically benign muscle tumors. Um, it's the most common primary cardiac tumor in children. 
and then tuberous sclerosis. So remember the, all the constitution of symptoms you can see in tuberous sclerosis, that is when you would see a cardiac rhabdomyoma. And so let's talk about these last three here. So we have Takot Subo, myocarditis, and acute pericarditis, and each has a picture in the same associated color. So Takot Subo, you basically have ballooning of the left ventricle. So you have an intense emotional stress. The ventricle just gets shot, but instead of it being the normal, you see like a, it's, it's almost like an acute dilated cardiomyopathy, but it has this typical weird looking gourd shape. And that's the Takatsubo is in relation to, it looks like an octopus is what it's supposed to look like. And so you get that in an acute intense emotional stress, usually in an older woman, the reason it's called broken heart syndrome is like um, an older woman after a um, significant other passes away, that sort of thing. Myocarditis usually has a preceding viral illness. So they'll give you a history of a, a runny nose. He had a history of a viral illness about a week ago. And then acute infectious symptoms. So now they're extremely feverish. And then symptoms of dilated cardiomyopathy. So as the heart muscle is damaged by whatever the virus, by whatever the case may be, um, Chagas disease can cause this, you'd have dilated cardiomyopathy. So you'd have acute S3 sound because the left heart would be floppy. You would have symptoms of volume overload, so on and so forth. Pericarditis also has a preceding viral illness, but instead of it's the myocardium that's, that's affected, it's the pericardium. So it leads to acute infectious symptoms as well, but instead of hearing an S3 sound and a dilated cardiomyopathy picture, you would have a friction rub as the heart beats against an inflamed and compressing pericardium. It causes a rub and you hear the scratchy sound. You also have diffuse PR depressions and ST elevations. And again, it's diffuse because the pericardium is inflamed throughout the heart. So it's affecting the cardiac conduction throughout the heart as opposed to in specific leads that would happen in a myocardial infarction.